So hello everybody, thank you for being here uh, again. We have here Jonathan K that he, uh, going deep in all this uh, terminology that we was speaking before, but now what is the methodology that you are working right now? What is your approach to that and why you are working with this? Uh, Just sure. Thank yes. You. Thanks for thanks for having me, Claudia. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, and yes, I mean, I uh, a little background about my my I guess the academic part of my journey. So after living in India for 10 years, learning raga music um, and before that being a jazz musician, I felt like I wanted to come and uh, come to uh, do grad school to learn a little bit more about the experiences I was having that I didn't seem to have language or concepts to help uh, communicate to others. And there was a lot that was being kind of lost in translation between the East and the West in my experience. And especially the deeper that I went into either my own tradition, jazz tradition, um, improvisation, or the Eastern traditions. And after 10 years of being in India, I had really felt like There was a lot of, of experience that I had that just that when I was trying to share that with other friends um, or family or other musicians in the West, it was really hard to to um, to kind of adequately convey the experiences that this deep immersion in raga music had. And so I ended up uh, attending. Uh, I'm attending now as a Ph.D. student, California Institute of Integral Studies under the mentorship of Debashish Banerjee. And I went to the school to study with uh, Debashish um, specifically, and I really have taken um, all of his classes and, and have TA'd with, uh, under him as well. And uh, so I've been learning. Um, I've been learning with him for, for my whole time in this PhD or in the, my master's and PhD. Let's be clear. And um, so I really feel like some of the methods that he is kind of innovating and bringing into the East-West Psychology Department at this institution are really um, powerful and I think um, they're innovative. They're, um, they're, they've really helped me find my voice um, as, as, um, as a transdisciplinary being in a way. I'm between now music, experiencing music and also cultivating and experiencing uh, and experiencing thinking, for instance. And so coming uh, from Debashish and the, um, his kind of, The, the elements in his thought, his East-West thought, he's an expert in um, integral yoga psychology and philosophy of Sri Aurobindo. Um, and that's what I had learned um, while I was in India. And so when I read his first book, uh, or the, the first book that I read of his, Seven Quartets of Becoming, spoke very deeply to me. And um, it really provided me with, with a kind of a contemporary uh, view to understand integral yoga. And I think that Debashish is is one of the the world's leading figures in 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 interpreting and bringing to the bringing to life integral yoga in the, the most contemporary type of way, in the way that I relate to it anyway. Um, and on the other side, what I uh, as I was coming into this department, it's an East West psychology, but also psychology, not not clinical psychology, more uh, um, kind of thinking about the questions of psychology, for instance. Um, And and that that also incorporates some philosophy, some philosophical questions, psychological questions are held in this East-West kind of axis um, that the department was really found on exploring um, back uh, many decades ago. But uh, I found myself uh, drawn to continental philosophy, which is kind of French um, philosophy coming out of the postmodern era. And I remember when I was first um, thinking about attending CIS under Debashish, I, I asked him, well, what Western philosophy should or psychology should I read to kind of get better acquainted with my the studies that will be coming up? Because I had tried to read some some more classical Western philosophy and it didn't speak to me that much. It, it, it was very different from what I was used to when I was uh, being immersed in the Eastern wisdom traditions, whether it's learning about Zen Buddhism, my travels to Japan, or um, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, for instance, I spent time in Dharamshala, um, and I I would spend time in these communities, staying there, also reading and studying and learning from practitioners, and it was really the idea of of there's there was a a, 
a, a body of knowledge that I could I could read from the scriptures. I could read interpretations. I was in these communities experiencing how people were living, uh, and also the aesthetics of the place, the temples, and the and the ways in which which um, kind of their community w- worked. It was all very interesting to me. It was a very immersive experience, and that's how I learned. But that's also how I think I felt that intersection of knowledge and practice. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when it came to reading some of the Western classical philosophy before my time at CIS, I didn't, I was trying to think, well, how does this, how do you practice this? What's the yoga of this thought in a way, you know? And, and actually Debashish did um, recommend reading a little bit of uh, Husserl, who was the father, uh, the founder of phenomenology, for instance, who c- could be considered to be doing a type of jnana yoga in a way. Um, but um, Husura, you say Husura? yes yes exactly he, yeah he was a, a german thinker and uh heidegger was a student of heidegger his. i knew heidegger but i don't yeah. I didn't know what the other one Husura, yeah Husura founded a, a phenomenology and um and heidegger was a student of his and then from heidegger a lot of what heidegger was dealing with um it it first of all questioned and also um expanded upon Husura's work but it also led to the rupture in a way it was one of the the threads the precursors to the postmodern rupture in a way mm-hmm. um, heidegger was so this is kind of embedded in some of the thought that debashish is really quite interested in and that's getting to the continental side so to answer your question the methodology that i found myself in uh, exploring how music thinks through me in a way how i can let music become like find that horizon or that intersection where music and thought can kind of engage and co-create like find an auto poetic node um is is really the horizon of of uh integral yoga psychology and philosophy from Sri Aurobindo and the mother Mm -hmm. and continental philosophy and so this paper that we will be speaking about I wrote for the Indian post-humanism network which was founded by one of the four main founding members was Debashish. And I've uh, worked with them. I've uh, helped them. And I'm, a, 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 I think, a research assistant um, for their work. And they had a conference. Um, they had the first conference, which was now, I think, a couple of years ago. But it was uh, an opportunity for me to explore this horizon. It's an east-west axis where um, I'm following in Debashish's footsteps and really trying to bring out how yoga and this continental thought, most specifically Gil Deleuze and Felix Guattari, sorry, are um, are kind of opening to uh, opening up similar questions, and also how both of them are fitting into what we can call posthumanism, which is an academic uh, milieu of thought that um, again was sort of coming coming very much from the continental thinkers um in the way i'm involved in it anyway so it's it's uh my methodology is is not phenomenology actually phenomenology is still a little bit more classical based on some more classical axioms um which uh i think that you know p- philosophers like deleuze will question and look to overcome um which is really certain ideas that are um have been assumed in classical western thought from kant or even from Plato onwards, but Kant being a very influential thinker in Descartes. And these are kind of um, figures that Deleuze was very much engaged in um, some of their, some of the problems that they, their thought had raised. And so uh, I guess that's, that's a little bit of, of the history of how the methodology I'm using is, is experimental for sure. It's cross-cultural um, and it's really, I'm really trying to allow the music to do the thinking in a way. And that's where I find myself at a loss of methodology a lot of the times too, <laughs> because this isn't something that is so um, commonly done. I don't think um, a lot of the times philosophy or, uh, you know, music, psychology, philosophy, aesthetics, for instance, is a field of study in philosophy that speaks about beauty and, and art. Mm-hmm. Musicology, for instance, a lot of the times it will speak about music practice and music experience, but not necessarily from music experience, because sometimes the the 
and again in the more uh, earlier times the thinkers weren't necessarily the practitioners and that's okay. a very important difference um yeah. to bring out and so my work is really is, is part of the scholar practitioner mode which is really i am a scholar and a practitioner and so i yes. think that's that's the beginning point for trying to engage on a different type of um methodology so that's a, a little bit of a a little answer to that <laughs> yeah it's very interesting uh deep thank you for the answer so uh, the next uh step and the next question uh even if i because i cannot follow you your answer is really deep <laughs> in my knowledge okay, uh, okay. it's going to be about uh the ragas. I was reading in your article that you that um, the ragas have uh, in history different definitions, yes, and that right mm. now they are looking for this kind of uh, is a debate. Is a debating, yes. It's like discussion, discussion about what is a raga and how to define a raga, how to conceptualize it, and how to write about. The raga, yes, and it, this is something that you are looking for also in your in your career, yes. Let's say, yeah, like, yes. So, uh, please let uh, let us know <laughs> first uh, uh, what is this raga. Uh, I mean, we know that it's certain music sometimes you say oh we go I, I go to youtube and i say i want to hear a raga and they say raga for healing yes and then you hear these ragas and it's like oh it's so peaceful or you can dance with this music because they are like very sometimes are very happy like i don't know have this essence of uh, to 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 place your i don't know your soul in a different dimension you know so it's the only thing I know about ragas, actually. You yeah, know, yeah. I can see these uh, illustrations, you know, sometimes that people play and play, but actually that's it, you know? And you speak a little bit in the last videos with me, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. something, but um, I don't know our public. <laughs> they have some knowledge yes yes really no fantastic relate question. and comes directly out of the what i was saying in the beginning i think because as i learned raga music it's an oral tradition and i sat with my gurus um i have i have a couple different gurus uh shantanu bhattacharya who's a singer and uh abir singh kanguda who's an estraj player they're my two main gurus and um, they both taught in a very traditional sense, um, and it was in the Guru Shishya Parampara, which means the Guru and the, the, the student in a way, or the mentor and the student, oral in the oral tradition. Um, the, you know, in Indian music, there are uh, forms of notation. It's not as uh, developed as in Western music, which, you know, a lot of orchestral music, for instance, relies upon written notation. And so there's been... Um, you know that's a big part of the the western tradition whereas in the east it's never been a part of the music um although there are techniques to transcribe it and so as a again as a kind of a a westerner coming into and immersing myself in raga music i was really um trying to follow the the traditional training the best I, of my ability i would take notes and i would record lessons and i would memorize and listen back i would um I sometimes write out little uh, phrases or compositions as a memory aid, but really it was mostly sitting at the feet of your guru and listening and and hearing and um, seeing. I would also say you see the raga in a way, which which really um, goes back to the Upanishadic methodology of of um, of darshana and and shruti, which is like kind of seeing and hearing. And I, that's that would that's how I felt my uh, found myself um, kind of learning 
um, these the ragas and and feeling how the methodology really goes back, you know, right to the Upanishads, um, which I think is an important um, important to note in my experience anyway. Um, but but I guess in terms of what a raga is, it's, it was always the most, it's, I still think it's the most fascinating question that I've ever come across. My guru, Shantanuji, at one point in my first trip to India, when I was taking uh, lessons with him, he said the, the potency of the raga is infinite. And I, it blew my mind. I'm like, wait a second, what, what does that mean? You know, yes, and exactly. whatever it, yeah, whatever it means is I want to try to do my best to experience what, what you mean by that. Cause I do trust what, what you're saying, if that's an experience of, that you've had, you know, um, his music moved me to the core, uh, and mm -hmm. there was something infinite about it. It felt very, very vast or at least much more vast than I had experienced, um, in, in, in that kind of way. And so that was really one of the big questions that I, I've held with me throughout my whole time studying raga music. And I didn't really read too much about raga music because, again, it's an oral tradition. It's mostly and I was mostly doing the, the work of of sitting and just taking lessons. And sometimes I would be studying, you know, four hour lessons with my guru, sometimes four or five times a week. Um, both of my gurus were very generous. Um and it also depended on what I needed. You know, it was very much a, a, a tailor-made pedagogy. Um, sometimes I didn't need to, to study that much because there was things I needed to practice and realize on my own based on what they had taught me already. But um, anyway, as as I um, grew in this music, I, w I got a little curious to know, well, what is written about raga music? What have other people expressed as their understanding of what this this music is? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I I can't read Sanskrit or Hindi or Bengali to read firsthand sources, but there are um, ethnomusicologists um, and music Indian musicologists from India who did write in English, and there was European uh, music ethnomusicologists that that kind of carried out the first types of system systematic studies of what they perceived a raga was, and. Some of the knowledge, you know, coming from like, let's say the late um, 19th century, early 20th century, it can be very dated, um, it, but some of it was very interesting and intriguing. And some of it really spoke to my experience. Some of it didn't. <laughs> and it seemed as though um, what was kind of uh, what was absorbed into mainstream ethnomusicology as I read more and more contemporary accounts of what a raga may be, um, it didn't really touch upon the profundity of what I was experiencing. And yes, you're right. There is a kind of, you could say there's a genealogy of knowledge that happens. It's always happening, you know, um, in terms of, you know, one person writes something, somebody else reads that responds to it they have different experience they have mm -hmm. uh, res you know they have a critical um, um response to that or they they will reinforce what's being said and and so yes the ra like raga understanding of raga for instance has gone through transformations and and it has been broadened and there are some really great ethnomusicologists who have done that work as well in the uh in the 70s and 80s um who I have really benefited from their work. One of them, um, uh, a Dutch man named Wim Vandermeer. And anyway, so I just felt that that this this was interesting, but it was the conversation wasn't done, and that's one of the reasons why I felt like I wanted to go back and do academic studies because I felt like um, I I wanted to kind of continue that conversation of what is a raga, what 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 is a raga, raga capable of, you know, like it, it's, it's a question that can never be fully answered, but, but it seemed to me that that was where, um, that was, that was a question that was pulling me into academics. And so at this point, I've, I have this, this paper, um, which is available on the Indian post humanism network website, which is post um, yeah, posthumanism.in, and you can find it. It's called Becoming Raga, North Indian Raga Music as a Technology of Integral Posthuman Becoming. And this is an attempt at adding to the conversation, um, 
from this intersection, which is which is quite unique. I think there's there's not um, there's not too many others. I don't know of any others who are writing about raga music, um, who who are scholar practitioners with the intersection with continental thought, and it's very interesting to me. It makes a lot of sense to me because the the concepts that that I find in continental philosophy. Um, are very musical. When I read them, I feel that, that I feel them activating musical experience. I feel them um, organizing thought in a way that seems to me very much true to my my musical life. And so that's why I feel that as a as a methodology, although um, experimental and maybe c- as contemporary as it may be, um, I think there's a lot of promise in just trying to. You could just say, like, look at uh, the experience of raga music from a different perspective around, you know, around the mandala or around the, the the circle, you know. So that's what's been interesting to me. And there's definitely no definitive answer that um, that anyone can give, because at the end of the day, a raga can't be reduced to some kind of, uh, for me anyway, it can't be reduced to an analytical understanding um, or even... Um, I mean, uh, even a poetic one or a philosophical or a psychological. All of these are lenses that we can kind of get a, a, a partial view of an experience that is really beyond that. But it it may be helpful, and it may um, help um, to it, it may help others to uh, to to see if they relate to what I uh, I am writing and the perspective I'm writing. But but just very oh yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, yes about these. I mean. You uh, speak about this raga mandala, raga uh, yes, yes. Uh, circle, raga uh, interaction, raga mm-hmm. made it in the moment. Yes, like um, you didn't really write notes. So it's coming to my mind and comes in on this conversation. So do you think that when do you speak with someone else? So this interaction that we do every day uh, can be can become a raga, can be a raga, can be a certain uh, way of. I mean, I know that we are not making music, or maybe raga have this have to be a music, I have to be in certain instrument, yes. But mm-hmm. uh, also the voice is an instrument, yes? And, mm-hmm. it, and the speech and all these kind of things that we do every day. For this reason, ancient knowledge always say, be careful with what do you say. Um, always be careful. I mean, always be intentional with your words when you speak with others and things like that, yes? So it's quite a... Now I am thinking, you know, it's like, so can we create this? I mean, I am, I don't know if I understand well the raga definition and these kind of things. So can we be a raga? Can we create this raga with our speech, with our everyday? Mm. Uh, I mean, can we find this raga in the voice of the birds so in the voice of yes is right yeah this is a profound question and this is a i think this is this is a very um it's a yogic question for me it's a metaphysical question as well and i love that you you asked this um so yeah just to be more clear because i didn't really define the rag at all i just tried i just spoke around how it's not so definable but how we can kind of we can kind of look at it with different perspectives, right? So I guess to, to track a little bit of this genealogy of thought of a, of a raga before getting to the metaphysical or the, the yogic aspect of your question. But um, at first people said, well, a raga is uh, a certain scale movement. So a scale that can that moves up a certain way and that moves down a certain way. Arohi, Avarohi would be the name of this. So there, there would be, there's a logic to how you would flow through an ascending and descending movement of the rag. And so you could say that's the first level of, of, um, 
of let's say musically understanding that um and it, it's it it rings true i mean there's something that is true about that but that's not a raga a raga is not a scale it's not a mode of music those words are also western words and they come with western histories and so the way in which we understand a scale in the west is nothing like a raga but we can use that framework um pr provisionally for instance so for instance here i could put on a drone let's see here um uh, so for instance you can ascend and descend um a specific way and this is going to be the etiquette of the rag so if i So it's like a like do re mi fa sol la si do I, like a, you go down and you go up at all the time like it's a, I, yes if exactly I understand. yes like yep 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 but it's maybe the scale is uh, different and it's bigger than do, do re mi fa sol la si do I don't know I am yes. speaking in Spanish <laughs> ah, no 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 it's, it's great um one second sorry I just have to I don't know why I can't see. Oh, originally, sorry, my settings here on Zoom have changed. So here we go. So, so for instance, a simple definition, our, our simple approach here. So it would be, if our, our this this is the Indian solfege, like you said, do, do re mi fa sol la ti do, is sa de ga ma pa dha ni sa. And for instance, rag yamen has a certain etiquette and a certain ascent and descent. So if the sa or the do is sa this raga will go ni re ga ma ta ni sa ni da pa ma ga de sa so that would be a, like um one the kind of the tip of the iceberg is that the etiquette follows you don't ascend playing through this, the the do the one or the five and that would be a very kind of i mean a superficial but uh, um a, a starting now the next definition of a raga would be a collection of phrases and so rather than thinking about it as a scale you think about it as very specific or a handful of phrases that are constantly developed and repeated and that is much more real to what a raga musician does now so that is uh, that is sorry that is similar to mantra or not not at all uh it's no a mantra would be a, a chanting um certain sanskrit well mantra could be any language in a sense but traditionally it would be sanskrit and you would use three tones the three intonation um that that comes like there's a whole um all these scriptures from the vedas that are talking about the way in which to chant now raga so, is relate related to that but this is this would be different ah uh, because you say repetitions like and so no okay. oh okay so yeah from that perspective i mean yeah when you chant you're using three tones sa ni re sa om shanti ho om shanti om so that's going to be your main chanting tones and you're right there's a re repetitive nature about it and some people would say that, that that helps to uh the memory when you put set things to tone and there's also something um that is very contemplative and meditative about it because you have this this drone your main pitch sa ni re sa and all these variations that are constantly moving around spiraling around your main note in this case, yes, raga could be considered an extension rather than having three notes. You're going to have a collection of phrases that will have three or four notes in them. So Yemen, for instance, is going to be sa ni da ni would be a phrase of Yemen. Ni re ga. And then ni re ga ma pa. Pa ma je. Gare ni da ni re sa. For instance, is one example of me singing. I sang four or five phrases, and those are 
very much the heart of the raga in a way um and that's a much better way to understand the raga because you're going to be doing that for most of the the raga recital and so it's a collection of phrases would be another level and a deeper level of understanding the raga so when you go to learn a raga you would be learning these very intricate and nuanced um phrases and their their kind of expansion they have a word called vistar and it would be uh, expansion is the best translation of that um it's not the same as improvisation which is again it leads us to this this lost in translation this east-west axis again because what as a jazz musician when i came to raga music i found that oh it's like improvising they're they're spontaneously composing or they're spontaneously improvising this music which is somewhat true but actually not so accurate because of the nature of how much uh of these phrases are pre-learned and how much you you actually really have to internalize very specific nuances and render those and then learn how to expand them without disrupting their um the 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 kind of architectonics that's another word i use in this um this article architectonics is talking about the relationality and and the 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 really the the, the kind of the ratios of the notes in the raga so for instance in rag yemen your knee your seventh degree is going to be a lot stronger your third degree ga is going to be a lot stronger heavier there's going to be a longer you're going to stand on those notes longer you're going to repeat them more um and therefore they are going to be the foreground in the architectonics there's going to be more weight on them and so proportionally speaking there's there's certain nodes in this in this mandala of the raga that have higher proportions and that's what i'm saying about the architectonics of it so when you expand the raga you're actually holding very similar or the same architectonic structure which is uh, not not really um, something that is so so true in just in jazz improvisation, although it may be there to some degree. So anyway, this is a little bit about the about the definition of a raga and how over the years people have have been able to articulate it a little bit more more nuanced in a, in more nuanced ways um there's also an idea of like what's the main phrase of the raga that the, the, the and that's that's another very important idea is that there's going to be one main phrase that really stands out um as being like the heart of the raga this is the this is the main expression of the raga again proportionally speaking that phrase will be um have the most uh, instances of it to keep the proper architectonics of the raga but and at this point this this is all good and this is all helpful for us to understand what a raga is but i really wanted to take um take understanding a raga understanding my experience and trying to express my experience of a raga to a spiritual level to a cosmic level as well to a level that can help describe um it beyond the confines of either musicological language um and even um and even cultural language for instance there was sometimes uh experiences that i had playing a raga that took me into some types of mystical states that i could not describe that i i had no no words or no handles to try to express but the raga was a practice um, a discipline a spiritual practice a sadhana if you will that that basically um slowly but surely and i i believe this is embedded this is what sadhana is is the super normalization of the, of cities in a way of 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 kind of cosmic powers of post-human or superhuman powers and so i think that that for instance ragas that's one of the goals from the yogic perspective and so bringing in the lens of yoga um can help bring out um these aspects of what a raga is that aren't it's not so commonly or less commonly um spoken about yeah i i, I now just also please ask your question but i i want to say i will have to answer the other the main question you asked last which was really the cosmic and the the metaphysical aspect <laughs> <laughs>